if I just, can you guys still hear me if I just talk? I like to walk and talk. Do you need the mic? Y'all prefer the mic. If you prefer the mic, I'll use the mic. I might be distracted with the mic. But I like to walk and talk. My students know that I like to walk and talk. It, it helps me. So I'm excited to be here. I've been coming here for three years. And I would say that UWE has become a second home to me. Many of the faculty and staff have become friends. So I enjoy every time I come here, but this is my first time being able to speak to you guys. So it's exciting. Today I wanted to talk to you guys about um, service learning. And I want to talk to you because service learning, in, in my view, can be a catalyst for cultural competence. When we think of catalyst, like what does catalyst mean? We think of something that makes makes change very quickly. I could have answered the time this morning. <laughs> but it makes something change very quickly. So what I'm saying is that service learning can change us to become more culturally competent. And I'll explain more of that. My big idea, and I always start with the big idea because if you guys want me to stop at that point, then I'll stop there. But the big idea is that we can utilize service learning as a way to help individuals become more culturally competent. We can purposely maneuver and utilize service learning to make sure that individuals develop cultural competence. See, service learning can be the vehicle, individuals inside the vehicle, and then it takes us to our destination, which is culturally competent. And I keep using the term service learning, and we're going to define it. So one of the things we're going to talk about is getting an understanding of what is service learning, what does she mean by service learning. We're going to develop a working definition of cultural competence because the topic is so vast and complex that we can take on many definitions and talk about that all day by right? itself. So, so we're going to have a working definition. We're going to talk about the relationship between service learning and cultural competence and the role of educators in that relationship. What is their role? And then I'm going to talk about a model that I use. Let me first frame this discussion. I've been bringing students here, my students here, for the last three years. And we started this journey, I've been coming here for years, but I've been to Ireland and Costa Rica prior to coming to Jamaica. Now what happened is, I wanted students to have a specific experience. I wanted to see a specific change occur in them. In Ireland, though rich in heritage and culture, many students can sort of relate to, to Ireland. It's not like being away from home. It's not challenging them in that way. Some of the values and beliefs are very similar. Costa Rica, however, very rich in heritage, very rich in culture, what do you think is the biggest challenge there? Language. So we were able to go there and do some things, but students couldn't really develop or utilize their skills in Costa Rica because there was a language barrier. And the language barrier was significant. And even though we had translators and maybe a couple of students that spoke Spanish, it was still hard to really develop and utilize skills. So no matter how much we love being there, we abandoned that idea. So now I started thinking about where have I been that I'm comfortable with that I know about the culture, that I can relate to, and I can introduce to this. And I had been to Ocho Rios in Jamaica. And I spent some time there. I had a wonderful time in Jamaica. And so my idea was, let's look in Jamaica. I'm familiar. I'm familiar with the people. I'm familiar with the culture. And I think the students will get the experience that they need. And the experience that I wanted to give them is, not just coming and having a good time within a culture, but being able to integrate within that culture and gain understanding of that culture and grow in a new way. So to me, this topic of cultural competence and service learning is something that's so important in today's society. How many people watch the news? Yeah. How many know about the US issues? Yeah, we need some culturally competent people in the US. Um, and and it, it starts, 
a lot of people need to take some study abroads and start to make some changes. But I think cultural competence is so important. And for our students, human service students, they go out and serve humans. I mean, that's what they do. They work with individuals. They provide a number of services. But how can they work with individuals if they don't understand their culture? I think if we think of that on our own experience, that when we went out in the community and helped and to do something or provide something within that community, we can think about some of the perceptions we had when we first entered that community some of the views we initially had when we entered that community. And how those views may have changed once we really got to know those individuals. So I think that's so important, and that's the reason why we're here. Now, we're going to talk about two terms, service learning and cultural competence. Who can tell me what comes to mind when I say service learning? Volunteers? Mm -hmm. Building houses. Building houses. <laughs> Missionaries. Missionaries. And we're going to talk about this definition a little bit more because service learning is a little bit different. The definition of service learning is a little bit more complex than us going out and volunteering, than us just going out into the community and trying to uh, do some type of service project like planting a tree or whatever, whatever we want. So service learning is a little bit more complex. When I say cultural competence, what do you mean? Understanding the culture. Understanding the culture. What else? I'm going to put my microphone down. No. Yeah. So it's more complex than just understanding the culture. Thank you. Because we can watch the news and think that we understand the culture, right? And we don't have to understand So we're going to talk about this a little bit more. So let's go to the term service learning. So yes, service learning is providing some type of service to the community. Definitely. But when I say service learning, service learning is tied to academics. It's integrated into the curriculum. It's part of a course. It's a way to meet some type of objectives. Now we're just not going out planting trees and building houses. Not that those things aren't important, but we want to meet a need. And we're not going and saying, you need me to build you this house. I'm going to say, what is it that you need from us? And how can we meet that need? So it's going to the community, developing a relationship, asking them what the need is, and then integrating that within your course so that the experience is not only meeting the need, but it's also part of the academic environment. So that's the difference between service learning and community service. But there's a model of service learning. So service learning basically says all we have to do is prepare you for the service. And prepare you to mean, you know, I'm going to introduce you to the need that you're going to be, you're going to go out and meet. It can mean, you know, let me introduce you to the agency you're going to go to. So I have to give you some type of preparation. The activity is the next step. That means you just go out and conduct the activity. Then you come back. You reflect on that activity. Then you evaluate the whole process as you let me know how that process was for you. Then I go to the agency and I ask the agency, how was that process for you? So that's the basic model. We simply prepare, but we don't talk about how prepared are you and what ways we need to prepare you. So what's missing from the definition that I just discussed? We basically said service learning is just to go out and meet a need within the community, and it's tied to academics. That all we need to do is prepare you, Give you an activity, you reflect on it, and you evaluate it. What's missing? The takeaway. Hmm? The takeaway. The takeaway. That's important. What do you get out of it? Yeah. Right? What happens within you? Culture. What about the culture? What about the future of that the population? What about the future of the population? 
there's a lot of things missing. We just have a basic, we're saying, okay, if I integrate service within my curriculum, then you go and meet the need and then it meets the objective. But there's a lot of components that are missing from that discussion. We don't talk about culture. We don't talk about diversity. We don't talk about the change that happens within the individual. All of those things, I argue, is important, probably more important than the service itself. Because something has to happen. Something definitely happens. Now, I can remember growing up, I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. Anybody familiar with Detroit? At all? In the U.S. People may not have heard nice things about Detroit, but I grew up in Detroit. And in Detroit, there was a big epidemic with drugs. And the major thing was crack. Everybody heard of the term crack? Yeah, it's crack. So I went away to college. I came back my undergraduate year. I came back. I was put into a service project. I didn't know where I was going. They placed me into a methadone clinic. This clinic was to help individuals wean off of the drug, crack, to get them off of crack. Now, when I grew up, the only thing I knew about people on drugs was that they were crackheads. So in my mind, every time I saw them, was crackhead. Lazy, don't work, dirty, has a disease. That's what I thought. Those were my views. That's how I was raised. The only term I ever heard was crackhead. So I walk in the methadone clinic and I have to work in here. The first thing that comes to mind is what? Crack. Crackhead. <laughs> right? Get lazy. I didn't have any understanding of addiction, of the population, of the individuals, or anything. I spent three months in this agency and my views became to change, began to change. What I started to see is these people as individuals. I started to gain an understanding of addiction. I started to find out about relapse. I didn't even know what relapse meant. I didn't know what methadone meant. What was the purpose of methadone? I didn't know. That was the first time I saw a baby with HIV. That was the first time I understood what it meant to be a mother and have an addiction and really want to be with your children and don't know how to do it. That's the first time I cried for someone who relapsed because I really wanted her to succeed. That was the first time I became human and understood that these individuals were human as well. They weren't crackheads. They just had a challenge. And though I thought that this was something they could just stop, I didn't know that individuals, once they get on crack, they're always chasing that initial high. That makes it harder for them to get off. And that's the reason why they have these methadone clinics, to give them another chemical to help wean them off. I had no understanding of that. My views had to be challenged. My biases had to be challenged immediately. What I thought I knew, I did not know. And that happens every day in our society. We go out, we see people on the street, of whatever, Name comes to mind, whatever we've heard growing up, whether whatever we've been cultured to say, it comes to mind. That's what we think. They're never gonna be nothing. They don't know nothing. Right? So what I'm arguing is that we need to be able to shape ourselves in a way. And there's a way to do that. There's a way for us to do that, to become more culturally competent, so that we get away from these biases. And I say that experience is the best treatment for that. So let's talk about our definition of cultural competence. Now, some have said it's understanding culture. But it's so much more complex, right? It's a process that we go through that we not only understand culture, we become more self-aware of ourselves and our own culture, our own beliefs, our own differences, our own biases, our own judgment, so that we can then support, accept, welcome other cultures, go to another culture and be able to ask, what's your belief about death? What's your belief? What's your religion? What's your culture's religion? Comfortable asking them instead of assuming that we know about them. And it's even a little more complex than that. See, cultural competence recognizes 
power, privilege. It recognizes the relationship between power, privilege, and oppression. The oppression is the one thing that people don't often want to talk about. Right? It's one of those things that's like a taboo. But in order to be culturally competent, we have to recognize that it exists. That there's a relationship between them. That there is a dominant group that can use their power to keep the subordinate group subordinate. It's recognizing and understanding that these relationships exist. So what does service money play in our understanding of culture? Service learning is leveraged right can take you from not being culturally competent at all to actually having some competence and be working on that process. See, it's a process. There's many levels to that process. We are one service learning experience away from being culturally competent. Just like we're one negative experience away from not. But if we leverage it right, we can make sure that we are on that path to being more open, accepting, affirming, supporting of people and their differences, of valuing differences, because there's nothing wrong with being different. Now, how can we use this as a tool? And I said this earlier. I believe that we can use it purposely for students, anyway, as educators, we can purposely use service learning to develop cultural competence. But it has to be at the root of the discussion. We can't just go to a model that says prepare, do the activity, reflect on it, evaluate it, and over. We have to talk about that process that happens within, the things that we don't see, the thoughts that we may not want people to know that we have. Those words that flow through our mind like crackhead, that we don't want anybody at the agency to know that we thought about, but that's constantly what we think about. Or when we leave, we go back home and we say, yeah, I worked with some crackheads today, right? So culture competence is on this continuum. There's stages to this. Remember I said it was a process. It's a process. And it's a continuum because we can go up and down this continuum at different stages of our lives. We can have experiences that change us and send us back down that, that continuum. Sometimes we have one bad experience with one person instead of accepting that person as a person, we accept that person as a whole culture of people. Those people. So there's different stages to that. The bottom of this ladder is cultural destructiveness, which means to destroy. So we want everyone, we want to force them to assimilate, force them to be more like us, force them to assimilate instead of valuing their differences. We only believe in the rights of the dominant group. That's all that's important. This is they're the majority. The next step is cultural incapacity. And this means that the racism comes into play, the discrimination comes into play, the unfair hiring practices come into play. Then the next level to this is cultural blindness, in which I say I'm just going to treat everyone different. I don't care if your race or your religion or your beliefs are different from mine. I'm just going to treat you all the same, everyone the same. So you need to wear a hijab. We don't wear hijabs here. You can't come into the workplace covered at all. You have to do everything like everyone else. We won't recognize any differences. We just treat everyone the same. We really only focus on the dominant group because the dominant group doesn't have these differences. So because they're dominant, we're going to do things that way. And then the next level is cultural pre-competence. And that's when we really start to think about maybe there's some issue here. 
Maybe we need to explore this oppression and, and this, this power and this privilege a little bit more. Maybe we need to look at systems. Is the system messed up? Is it me that's messed up? We start to think about it. This is where we can start the process of change. We're thinking that maybe this is true. Then we have cultural competence, which we've defined already. But then the last stage is cultural proficiency. And that's where we say, no, we have to create change. We need to be the change that we want to see in the world. And so what I'm arguing is that if we have a service learning experience, purposely rooted, that makes us vulnerable, it can take us, take us up this continuum. We may come in at cultural blind, but we may leave that cultural competent. into that treatment, drug treatment facility, I don't even know where I was on that level. I had all kinds of thoughts in my mind of things that I've heard about the different people. I didn't recognize they even existed as people. But when I left, I was definitely more compassionate. I was more self-aware. I saw them as human beings. I became more competent about the culture and about the challenges. So what I'm saying is that educators play a very important role. As an educator, we can develop experiences. As an educator, we can purposely develop leverage service learning opportunities that help people become more culturally competent. And I'm not going to say I just came to this point, you know, three years ago, and I said, I'm going to do this and make these students more culturally competent. Because my focus was not on cultural competence at that time. It was focused on the service and meeting the But cultural competence was a process that I saw start to happen within my students. Now, I realized that I had some control over that. So I started talking to my colleagues here in Jamaica about things that I can add to make the experience more better. And we'll talk about that model. Things that I've been able to add, things I've been able to do and leverage to make sure that they actually grow culturally throughout the experience. So educators have to make their curriculum embrace the culture. So again, we're still integrating service learning into the curriculum, but we're purposely making sure that our, our curriculum is affirming and, and open and culturally appropriate and accepting and challenging in a way so that students begin this process of becoming more culturally competent before they even get into service learning activity. So it goes beyond preparation. Now, over the past three years, this is the model that I've used. And as you can see, at the root of my model, at the foundation of my model, is cultural competence. Instead of me focusing on the need and the service, I'm focusing more on the students and the growth. Making them more culturally aware, making them more self-aware. Because the change happens when you begin to know yourself when you begin to learn more about your own beliefs and why those beliefs exist. So I use a model that, yes, I start with preparation. I prepare them for the, for the experience. I introduce them to the population. I talk to them about the need. But I go further and I immerse them in the culture. I go further and I start to really have them see themselves within the culture. We start to talk about, once you get there, how do you think this will change you? So they not only prepare for what they're going to experience, but they also learn about the culture and start the process of learning about themselves and what differences do exist. But I even go further. I do in-country, and this can be local or international. For me, it's been international. But even if we were doing service learning in our own country, 
we would do on-site orientation, where they learn about the culture of the agency that they're servicing. But here we do in-country lectures that I specifically ask specific lecturers to talk about specific things to really start this process of them thinking about this culture in a different way. Again, immersing them in the culture. And all of this comes, we haven't even been out to the community. We haven't went and met anybody. All of this happens before we go so that they can begin this process of change, thinking about themselves, thinking about the differences, having some knowledge, coming in, being able to make a connection because they have some understanding. They're not just those judgmental Americans, right? And then the next step we go to is the actual activity. Now, the service activity is an activity, for me, I work on this all summer before I even have students that are coming with me. Because I want to make sure that it's relevant, that it still meets a need, that I'm not assuming that there's a need that I need to go in and fix. I'm asking an agency, what is it that you need from me? What is it that you need from us? How can we help? And if my students come and do this, would this be enough? I'm looking for materials and things that my students can use and take with them that's not only helping them to grow, but also meeting the need within their population. Then from that experience, we process it. Now, processing is a little bit different. Processing is when we have open and honest conversations about ourselves, about our differences, about our vulnerabilities, about our comfort, about our biases, about the things that challenge us. I make sure I leave my door open because I may have to have private conversations with individuals who have been challenged in a way that they've never been challenged before. Processing is such an important stage because it's the point where they start to be honest with themselves about the experience. It's the point where they start to think about how their experience is so much different as a result of the service that they created or their service opportunity that they would not be there. So we do this processing. Some people call it debriefing, where we sit down and we talk. There's no judgment. I don't need to judge them. They're already thinking about the differences. They're just sharing them with me, getting my perspective. And I always tell students, if you're uncomfortable and you're vulnerable, that's good. You shouldn't come into a place where you're so comfortable that everything goes back to sight. You're supposed to come and be changed in some way. And what I've noticed is that over the years, my students are changed. I just started looking at the data will help you to start putting this presentation together is that students are changing whether I purposely went in to change them or not. They were changing prior to me even recognizing what needed to occur. And the next step is reflection. One of the final requirements of all of my students is that they reflect. They have an assignment. They have to reflect. They have to reflect on the experience. They have to reflect on the travel. They have to reflect on the journey. They have to talk about their change. They have to talk about the experiences that they had. And you're going to see some of the outcomes of those reflections in a moment. And then the next step is evaluation. The evaluation part is where we evaluate the entire experience as a whole, but also the agency tells us, our partners tell us, how did it go? I check in with the director here, and he asks me, how did, how did it go? And we see what changes need to be made, and we evaluate the whole process, and we start it over again. And we start it over again almost immediately. So everything that we do is purposeful. It has a purpose. I tell my students, if you're uncomfortable, that's what I want. Good. If you come back and you wanted to cry because you left, that was good. Because I did that on purpose. Purposely, I came to change you in a new way. Now when you go out and induce, introduce yourself to a new culture, to a new population of individuals, 
you will see them as human beings and be more open to learning more about them as, instead of seeing them as, you know, I already know about this culture. I already know about Jamaica. We watch them on the internet, you know, they do carnival and this dance hall. I know about them already, right? Is that true? You don't know what you think. You don't know anything if that's what you think it is, right? So these are some of the outcomes from some of my students. And I only put three here because I have so much. And I'm actually in the process of going through the data and sort of publishing this cultural competence piece. But one of my students said, there were many factors that made myself different. To me, I was done. I wanted you to know that you were different. It was important for you to be able to be self-aware and recognize that there are some differences. And she went on to say her culture was different, her social economic